Okay. Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Peter McCormick, and I'm going to redo that because that was <laughs> No, you're not. No, 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 you have to use that now. If, 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 if right. you redo it, if you redo it, then I'm, then I'm going to ruin it. You have to use it. <laughs> All right. Fair. All right. So most people know Peter from What Bitcoin Did, his podcast, uh, his new podcast, Defiance. <laughs> and, um, I'm going to just let him introduce himself. Hello, I'm Peter McCormack. You might know me from my podcast, What Bitcoin Did, and my other podcast, Defiance. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I've got those teddies as well? Do you? You should put them yeah, up. Yeah, I got those. Yeah, I, uh, I think my daughter stole them from me. Uh, they are pretty cute. They are very cute. I wanted to have an interesting background. So, um, yeah, these are the, for viewers that don't know, these are the magical, magical crypto friends. Um, and I completely blanked when I was going through their names. So I'm just going to call them the magical crypto friends. <laughs> we've got, but, we've got uh, Fluffy, Well Panda, Samson, and, and the Chick and Charlie Lee. Who's, who's, the, who's on the other side? Who's the dog? Um, this is um, my, uh, this is Fine Dog. Fine Dog. Well, you know the, okay, so you know, this is fine. The, the dog that's like sitting like in a room that's on fire. And he's like, this is fine. Oh, is it that dog? Yeah. Ah, it's a meme. You've got a meme, Teddy. I do. <laughs> That's why I thought it was a dead room. I thought you were using these to, to silence the sound. Um, they also help with that. So dual purpose. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I think it's cool. <laughs> I never grew up, apparently. <laughs> Don't grow up. It's a trap. <laughs> it is. It, uh, it's the biggest trap around for sure. Um, so before we get into what you're working on now, um, there of course are, are going to be viewers that, that don't, that don't know you in the space. Um, so I'd love to hear just briefly, what's your, your backstory and what drew you into Bitcoin? Yes. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I've told it a couple of times, so, um, so I, I kind of had two phases of coming into Bitcoin. Uh, the first time was I wasn't really a Bitcoiner, um, it's back in 2013 when a friend of mine phoned me up and said, uh, Pete, there's this website where you can buy drugs. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you can buy drugs. So like, what do you mean you can buy drugs? He's like, like anything. You can, buy, you can buy drugs. I was like, okay, that sounds cool. <laughs> Didn't think much of it. Thought it was bullshit. And then... Um, <laughs> couldn't get it to work. I was like, I can't find it. And, and I realized, cause you obviously find out later on, you need to use a tour browser to get to it. So anyway, so I kind of gave up and then phoned me up again. He was like, Pete, have you been on it? It's brilliant. It's like, you can buy anything you want. And I was like, I can't, I can't find it. He's like, Oh, you need to, did you not use a, like a tour browser? So anyway, he ends up uh, coming around my house and showing me this website, getting it up. And I was like, what the fuck? you can buy drugs online. And I was, I was like, just totally blown away. And he was like, yeah, the, the best thing about it is they're also reviewed. So like they rate the dealers. So the dealers won't sell you crap. It's like, this is amazing. So being at the time quite a, uh, I, I used to like taking drugs um, in, in the olden days. And uh, I was like, well, how do you do it? So he, he taught me through the steps. He was like, well, you need to buy this you get this stuff called Bitcoin. It's, it's like a money that can't be traced. Obviously, we know that's different. That's not true enough. It's like you can't be traced. And then you just go on and you buy it. You transfer the Bitcoin and then um, use PGP to um, like communicate with them. And then when you have it posted, use your address, but don't use your real name. So so you've got plausible deniability if the police turn up and it says like... Um, i tell you a funny story about that as well, actually. So I just used this name, Andy Turner, for no reason at all, just, just came up into my head. So I used to always send it to Andy Turner at my house. And then one day I met an Andy Turner at work. We had this new client when I had worked in advertising. He came in and uh, he introduced himself as Andy Turner. And uh, I didn't tell him straight away, but I ended up telling him the story. But, but yeah, so I was just like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, so I was using the Silk Road. And then, uh, and then I like traded a bit of Bitcoin, but like on CFDs on plus 500, I wasn't really into Bitcoin. I, I hadn't looked at it 
as anything. I hadn't looked into decentralization. I didn't know there was a blockchain. I didn't know anything about it. All I knew is that I had to go on this website called localbitcoin.com and um, buy the Bitcoin. And that would get sent to a wallet I had on my desktop. And then that wallet on my desktop, I would send to, um, what's it called? I would send to uh, Silk Road and just use it. But I never spent any time looking at Bitcoin, traded a bit, made and lost a load of money very quickly. And then then I went through like a bunch of weird life shit, which meant I you know, stopped taking drugs and uh, got divorced and all that stuff and just forgot about it. And then... I, you know, after the price crashed in, I think was it early fourteen. Again, just ignored it. But occasionally, I would look back and see the price and you know, have a look. And and then a few years later, uh, my mum gets really sick, and we want to get her cannabis oil to treat her. And you know, my dad was like, "How do we do it?" And I was like, "Well, <laughs> remember I had that drug problem?" And he was like, "Yeah." So I said, "Well, I used to get it off this website, and the Silk Road wasn't there anymore. It's like Sheep Marketplace or something else." But so then I ended up buying a Bitcoin on Coinbase to go and buy this treatment for my mother. And then uh, when I was on Coinbase, I saw this other thing, Ethereum. I was like, oh, this looks interesting. And I was out of work because I quit my advertising agency. So I just put a bunch of savings into Bitcoin. And that was end of 2016, 2000, start of 2017. And three and what have you, three, nearly three and a half years later, here we are. <laughs> mad, really mad that it's been that long. Yeah, time flies. It's um, mm. especially in this space. Except when you're on a lockdown. <laughs> Good God! Yeah, I'd like to get into that um, soon. But before we do that, um, for viewers that don't, uh, viewers and listeners that don't know your podcast, what Bitcoin did, and I, I can't imagine they would because it's uh, one of the most popular podcasts in the the space. You've had uh, pretty much literally anyone who's building uh, things in the space on multiple times. Uh, I noticed you recently had uh, NVK and Andrew Polstra. Um, and yeah, I just, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, why you started it and uh, what people can expect to get out of it. Uh, well, thank you for your kind words about it. Um, so why did I start it? So when I was getting off the drugs and trying to get over my divorce, I took a year off work. And during that year, when you, st when you just stop working, it's really hard to fill your day, to suddenly fill your day with stuff to do. You, you do the, the basics, like you start cooking food, real food, every meal for something to do. So that was cool. So I'd cook a meal and then I'd just kind of watch some TV and maybe have a nap and just I really struggle for stuff to do. So I decided just to go to the gym every day and I'll do whatever class was on. It doesn't matter. I was doing Pilates with old grannies and yoga and whatever. And so I started doing this, the yoga class, which was all right. And then through a chain of events, I ended up on a yoga retreat in Italy. I, I, you know, I was in a pretty fucked up place that year. So I was just like, I'm going to do everything. And, uh, and this yoga retreat was run by this guy called Rich Roll, who's like a vegan athlete who's done loads of unbelievable things and i really got on well with him me and me and him really got on well and when i was out in la about because that's where he lives about a few months after that and i'd been trading the bitcoin and was terrible at it like made my loads of money in a really lucky way and then lost loads in a really lucky way and i was like i know my future's not in trading plus it's boring so I, I said to Rich, I said, he's got a podcast, a really successful, successful one. I was like, Rich, I think I'm going to do a podcast. And he was like, all right, so if you're going to do it, this is the equipment you need. So I just went on Amazon and ordered it the next day. And then I messaged Luke Martin because he's in LA. And I was like, look, dude, I think I'm going to do a podcast. Do you want to be the first guest? And he said, yeah. So I got an Uber and went up to his house, recorded the first show and released it two days later. And that was it. Just went on from there. Um, did a couple more interviews. Then I contacted Jameson Lop, and I was like, because I, I didn't know who he was at the time. It was just this guy with a beard and, and a gun and a, and a hat. And I was like, uh, <laughs> hey, man, I've just launched a podcast. Can I come and interview you? And he's like, yeah. I was like, well, I'm in, I'm in the UK. I said, well, I'm in London, um, but I'll fly to you. And also, can you take me shoot, to shoot guns? Because I've never shot a gun. And he was like, yeah. All right. So I went out, turned up at his house. He had like, 30 guns out which was unreal because i've never seen a gun and we recorded the interview and uh went and got some barbecue and i was a vegan at the time but 
he took me to this place for barbecue and I was like, I haven't got the heart to tell him. I'm not going to tell him I'm a vegan. This guy with guns and shit. And so I was like, so I broke my veganism and had barbecue. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's nice. Um, and then, and then I didn't do any shows for like a couple of weeks and then I decided to take it a bit more serious. And then since then I've never missed a week. And that was two and a half years ago. Um, nice. And the show's kind of, I think it's a mix of things. It's a Bitcoin show, right? So I touch on economics, libertarianism, politics, wider issues. And I think what I try and do is make it a bit of fun. So like cover the culture and the history, all the historical events and people. But I also like to, like when we get into things like trading or the tech, I just like to keep it really easy and simple because I just think most people don't have the time to spend all day, every day looking at this shit. Like some people do, but most people don't. And I think... If they're, if they're one or two hours a week on Bitcoin is listening to my show, then I just want to be really easy for them to digest and a bit of fun. So I've always tried to do that. And it pisses some people off because some people are like, oh, you're not technical enough. Or you're a moron. But I think it works. I think it's, it's a, I would say listen to my show. And then once you've done with mine, then maybe, then maybe go and like listen to the real technical ones. But yeah, that's what I've tried to do. Very cool. So before we get into Defiance, you actually have an, a newer... Um... Well, is it out on Defiance, the Beginner's Guide to Bitcoin? It's actually out on both of them. I'll tell you what happened. So I did the 17-part Beginner's Guide for what Bitcoin did. And then some people were like, yeah, it's a bit long, too long. I was like, okay, thanks. So I was like, I'm going to make it into one episode. So I spent about two weeks on it, just going through every episode, all 20 hours, writing down, like noting all the key points when the people say the key most important things that we want on there. And then um and writing a narration and i put that together and i was like i'm going to put this out in defiance because it's a slightly different audience and they can learn about bitcoin quickly and so yeah i put that out on wednesday and then i um had a guest who was meant to be on recording yesterday with for what bitcoin did today but he cancelled because he was sick and it, i mean one of those rare times where i don't have a backlog and i didn't have a backup so i was like Do you know what? i'll just stick out what bitcoin did as well so it's out on both shows i've done that twice Sometimes there's a show that needs to be on both. Cool. Well, and what, um, I guess your first episode was with Andreas Antonopoulos, who's... Uh, it was. Yeah. Um, and then it gets quite technical. So um, I guess, why did you decide to make that? And uh, what are the highlights for you uh, from that show? Well, so, I mean, really what I wanted to do was, I wanted to uh, make, I wanted to make the beginner's guide I wanted when I started that would touch on each subject enough to like spike my interest and therefore I can just continue looking into the bits like I wanted to look into. But I also made it for me as like an exercise in uh, testing my own stuff. So like one of the episodes is actually me. It's my engineer interviewing me about some of the subjects. Because I sometimes I feel like I understand the subject, but I'm very bad at articulating it. So I was like, if I make it for me, if I uh, if, and, 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 like it will be a real test for myself because they always say they're like a good way to learn something is learn how to explain it to other people. Um, so yeah, so that meant we, I would touch on lots of different subjects. Um, but I actually, even though it gets t quite technical at times, I, I did try and keep it as top level and as simple as possible. It's just really hard sometimes because Bitcoin is technical, right? Mm -hmm. It is for sure. Um, but it is important that, um, that you're able to explain it simply to people, especially as we get more adoption. Uh, I mean, of course you need to understand it. You shouldn't, you know, ever just trust anybody to like, I think you need to put in the research and, you know, do your own research. Right. Um, uh -huh. But uh, I think that's awesome that uh, you created that. I know one of the episodes I was watching this and uh, you said, you know, don't be, don't be afraid if you don't get it right away. Uh, use it yeah. as a bookmark and go and like, there's show notes and dig in a little bit deeper. And I think that's a really wise way to explain Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, look, it is complicated, right? It it isn't easy to understand. Um, there's and there's so it's like there's so many different things you have to try and get your head around. But you learn you learn by doing. Just throw yourself in there, have a play with Bitcoin. I always say you learn by doing, and like don't beat yourself up if you don't get everything straight away. I'm here three and a half years later, and there's still so much I don't know. <laughs> well, it's a, it's an ever evolving space, so um, yeah. Um, okay, let's get into Defiance. Um, so Defiance is your new podcast. And I know you were mm -hmm. talking about having a conference with that as well, which I imagine might be on hold with the pandemic. 
Yeah, well, a couple of reasons. I, I, I like the idea of doing a conference, but then I also wanted to start making films. So I started doing films as well. So the idea of a conference is, you know, on the back burner. It's not to say I won't do it. Um, yeah, Defiance has been going for six months now. It's not found the same success as the Bitcoin show. So I'm changing the entire format for it. Um, it's done okay. I mean, it's got some like interest. There are some people who really love it. But I tried to just carry over the interview format, just the guest, you know, me and a guest for an hour. And I think one of the reasons it doesn't work is because well, it might eventually, yeah, it might be just a long term thing, but there's such a broad set of, of topics I'm covering where it's like the, the Bitcoin shows, I'm covering Bitcoin. So I get mm-hmm. everyone who's in Bitcoin and everybody who comes on, you know of them. And, you know, you see Jameson Lopp and you want to hear what he has to say because he's just fucking cool. And, you know, and you get those rare nugget interviews like a Nick Zabo and everyone's like, I know who that is. I want to listen to it. But when you get into these other topics, it's kind of like, unless you get Edward Snowden or Julian Assange, most people are quite niche. Uh, and, you know, you might have an interest in human rights, but you might not know who a human rights lawyer is in, I don't know, in Iran, who's trying to, um, who's trying to uh, defend uh, women who are forced to wear a hijab. Well, you might not know, you just might not know these people. And then what I realized, actually, people probably, it's not so much the guests, it's the topic. So we started working, because I've got a team now, we started working on the background of these um, kind of mini documentaries, like one, one hour, one episode documentaries. Or, and we're just about to finish the first one. So we're doing the scripts today. Mm-hmm. And rather than do like focus on the guest, I mean, I, I give you a little exclusive what's coming out next week. It is, um, so the title is The Banking Cartel, How Big Business and the Government is Stealing Your Money. And I've got some cool guests. So I've got like Caitlin Long, Rao Powell, Andreas, uh, Ben Norton, and this like UK professor. And what we've done instead with this is, we've told a story we're like we've built like a mini documentary you know we're in a financial crisis this is why this is how money works these are the people who like you shouldn't trust these are the people who fuck with you so we're just trying to like it's a lot more work but it's a lot more interesting so um so that's coming out soon and i'm also making a like an audio documentary with this band this like metal band called the ghost inside who had a bus crash in 2015 and the drummer lost his leg. It took like four years for them to get there, get back on stage. It's just a really interesting story. So yeah, Defiance is changing shape. It's becoming more like audio documentaries and less based on interviews. Cool. Um, I saw recently as well on Twitter that the uh, one of the uh, co-creators of the Clash reached out to you. Who's uh, he's also a Bitcoiner. <laughs> Yeah, one of the founding members. I mean, he left before they started recording, but he was one of the founding members. That was that was just weird. <laughs> I actually know a song from his other band. I can't remember what they're called now, but a bit more. But I get this email come in. I'll read a little bit for you because it's kind of I've got it here. It just kind of it was just a real cool thing. So, um, all right, which one is it? Give me a second. Um, probably haven't even got it here, man. Me, uh, I can't find it. But if I um if I did dig out, I mean, if he just basically said, "Hi, Peter. My name's so and so. I was a guitarist in the Clash. Not sure if that means anything to you." I'm like, "Huh? <laughs> what the fuck, are you on about? It's the Clash. It's not like some random. This is like a band everyone in the world knows." And you know, I had a Clash T-shirt. Um, I used to wear it, it and even even though I didn't listen to them a lot. Even when I was at uni, just because I was like, "That's so cool, a Clash T-shirt." I was like, of course I know you. And he was so kind. He was so nice about my shows. And he like really likes the show. And I was like, man, you just got to come on. Like, let's make a show. Let's like Bitcoin's punk rock, right? Why don't you come on and let's talk about why Bitcoin's punk rock. So it was really cool. So we did a Skype and it was really weird because I think we were both nervous. <laughs> Because I was nervous because he was a founder member of the Clash. And I think he was a bit nervous because he's so mad keen on Bitcoin. Like, he just wanted to talk about Bitcoin. And it was just a really cool conversation. So, yeah, we're going to hopefully make a show next week, awesome. which I think is really cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting when um, all your interests kind of converge. And, you know, Bitcoin is punk rock. Uh, I think Andreas said that. I, I don't know if he coined the term. But, um, yeah, it's it's very it's very cool. You know, it's a it's a peaceful protest, right? It is a peaceful protest. Yeah, you're right. Awesome. 
Um, so for people looking for your shows, um, you're on YouTube, obviously, and, and where else can they find you? Yeah, I mean, I'm on all of, I'm on SoundCloud, Spotify, all the apps. If you just go to either website, you can go to whatbitcoindid.com or defiance.news and you will find them. And if you want to check out my films, uh, you can get them at defiance.news, but it's youtube.com forward slash defiance TV. But yeah, if you Google what Bitcoin did, you'll find it. Awesome. Um, so right now we're dealing with a global pandemic. And uh, I wanted to ask, how is that? I mean, obviously, it's it's changed lives dramatically. Um, how has that changed you? And how has that impacted your goals and changed you for the better? Or has it? Good questions. Um, yeah, really good questions. It's weird, right? So I just started making films and going out and making films. I was really enjoying it. And then that's been, that's, that's like, that's been put to an end for now. I can't go out and make films or I don't want to go and make the wrong films just because I'm restricting what I'm doing. Like I know right now the subject I want to cover most is refugees. I really want to cover refugees. I can't cover that at the moment. So I'm not going to go and make some other films. So that's been just put on the back burner now. And, and now I'm focused on, um, you know, my podcast craft, but what I'm trying to do is I've, I've said, look, I'm going to use this time to learn about the creative process. And create try and create the best podcast i can um to the point where i've, I've bought got so many books like creative non-fiction <laughs> the writer's journey i've got the art of dramatic writing making good scripts great like i was like i'm just gonna read this is what i do alex when i like want to learn about something i just read everything about it and i just do everything i can to be the fucking best uh, 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 as i can and i was like i I think I'm going to learn my craft actually making audio documentaries. So I'm making a Bitcoin one, the battle for Bitcoin. There's one about the band I told you about, but like this one about the band, it would be very easy just to go. So there's this band, they had this accident, they all got these injuries, they got better and they, you know, did this comeback gig and that's, you can just do that. But I don't just want to do that. I want to tell the story in the most fascinating and interesting way so that somebody like my dad, who doesn't care about hardcore metal finds it interesting. So, so I'm just going through the process. I thought I'll use this lockdown to learn about the creative process. You know, how do you tell a compelling story? How do you keep people engaged? So yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. I've, I've been focused on that and it's been really good for me. Um, I've spent a lot more time with my kids, which is great. Uh, we go out every day and exercise together. We, cook meals together which we haven't done in a long time we hardly ever have a, we had a pizza last night and that was the first one i mean we used to go out for dinner at least once a week and one takeaway a week and you know what sometimes we'd be really shit and like three or four days a week we'd go out for dinner or takeaways i mean mm -hmm. we're cooking every meal and not just cooking every meal cooking good meals and baking cakes and just and playing games all that stuff has been brilliant uh downsides Definitely felt the the mental challenges a couple of times, you know. Um, that's been tough a couple of times. Uh, definitely drunk too much during this. Just got into the habit of just drinking every day, mm -hmm. um, which I've stopped. Um, but it's a balance, right? But overall, I think it's done a lot. Like if if you can just forget about for the moment, just isolate that. Um, it's been terrible, so terrible for so many people. Not just people are dying and the families but also just people losing their jobs and this economy is just fucked right now just isolate that for a moment and just say it has been a chance to reflect on life and and how you live it and i mean i i hardly ever drive my car at the moment to the point i actually realized i don't really need a car if you think about how often i'm using my car i probably and i say your payments for like us money say it's like 400 dollars a month it's like I'm spending four hundred dollars a month plus fuel plus insurance. I'm spending six hundred dollars a month on a car. How often am I actually using the car to do the shopping? Well, I can order that online if I want. So I'm hardly ever actually using the car. So probably I could just not have a car if I wanted to, and find a way of, without it. Am I going to do that? Probably not. But but I think I could. Um, so yeah, and also I th I've always liked the city, but this has made me want to go and get a house in the countryside by a lake or something just in the middle of nowhere and be away from people. How's it been for you? 
I mean, it's been different. So I live in Canada, uh, in Vancouver, and it's, uh, we have kind of a soft quarantine, like it's not, uh, it's not mandatory stay at home. We're strongly encouraged to, uh, to respect social distancing and, you know, physical distancing. So it's two meters away or, or six feet. Um, I mean, for me, it hasn't changed all that much, except I can't go out to events. Everything's kind of moved virtual. Um, you know, I'm able to record. I kind of converted, you can see my closet <laughs> into mm -hmm. a recording studio. Uh, so that works out well. And um, I mean, one thing that, uh, one positive thing is I've been going out into nature a lot more. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's good. That's something I've always enjoyed doing. So there's, I mean, you've been to Vancouver? I have been. So, you know, I really liked it as well. Cool. Now we've got, you know, we're known as beautiful VC and it's, uh, you know, there's so much as far as trees and parks and like everything is just so accessible. So um, I've really been taking advantage of that and going out and exploring the trails and that's been good. Um, been running more, but it's weird because, uh, you know, I, I live downtown and I see, um, I'm lucky in that I don't have buildings like right up next to me, but uh, you know, I can see it kind of across the way. Uh, some people are just like stare out their window. I was commenting to a friend the other day. It's like, uh, it's like we're forgetting how to be people. And uh, that's a, it's concerning because it's such a, I don't know that we've been through as, you know, as humanity, I don't think we've been through anything. This, um, it just challenges so many norms, you know, you're going through stuff, you like call up a friend and go hang out, you know, go grab uh, a, a drink at a, a bar or a pub or go for a walk. And like, you can't do those things. You can't, you know, birthday parties or any kind of celebrations or uh, any kind of events that would mark something uh, that should be marked um, just don't happen anymore. Or at least they happen virtually, but it's different. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's going to be, unfortunately, a whole lot of fallout uh, that comes from this. Um, I think it's very unfortunate. Uh, at the same time, um, it opens up new opportunities. So um, I don't know. I guess we'll see where we are in six months. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. Um, I, I'm just using it as an opportunity to reset my life and the way I approach things and what I want out of it and things are going to do. I think that's all you can do. I think a lot of people are going to have some really difficult times coming up and it's like sink or swim for some people. You kind of, you moan about it and just think the world's against you and we just get on with shit. Some people will get on with shit and other, others won't. And I just think you just got to get on with stuff. Yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, it's weird because so many people have lost their jobs and for, for me yeah. anyway, as well. Um, well, for me, um, I think for, for most people, um, career is kind of part of your identity. So if all of a sudden that goes away and you can't do that and you've got to make your own way, um, for people that haven't done that in the past, I think it's a much harder transition. Um, and also that uncertainty, um, people by and large do not do well with uncertainty. Some people do, um, but it's not a natural state, um, for, you to really thrive uh, in an environment of uncertainty. You can definitely train yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have no coping skills with like uh, things rapidly changing, uh, then it's a very, it can be a very hard transition. Yeah. Well, we'll just have to see how it all plays out, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's one of the thing, encouraging things is seeing people, you know, taking the time to learn new skills and you know, uh, I know so many people are like, oh, I would do this if only I had time. Well, now you have time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a matter of, you know, making sure you're focused and, and working toward it and not taking on too, too much. So you like, you know, go all in and then give up. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I do think some of the lockdowns are, uh, they're a little harsh. Uh, at the same time, it's something that like, we don't know the virulence of this. Um, I think, I think when we get more data it'll be interesting um but i do think that a lot of people have been harmed by overly restrictive uh lock lockdowns it's, it's the unwinnable situation right yeah if you exactly yeah it's um yeah so <laughs> yeah. on to on to happier topics <laughs> yeah <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things that um, people want to know more about, uh, especially if they, they know you or they know your story, 
Um, a while back, you had um, oh, people in this space know Craig Wright. And so you've got an ongoing case. And I know you can't talk too much about the case, but um, maybe a little bit about how that started and, and why you decided to, to speak up and what you've maybe learned. <laughs> yeah, that motherfucker. Um, right, well, look. Um, uh, so he obviously came out with him and Calvin. I call him Captain Bumbeard. Um, but he came out with a Calvin and said, we're going to sue anyone who calls him a fraud. Everyone's been calling him a fraud for years, right? It's just relentless. It's just Craig Wright's a fraud and uh, fake Toshi. Just, you just see it everywhere. You just everywhere you go, that's what people are saying. So it's not like it's like some hidden secret that people have this opinion of him, but they just started to do this sinister thing. I mean, they launched their stupid blockchain. Um, you know, they launched a stupid blockchain and then they said they're going to sue anyone who's, you know, discredits Craig. And it was kind of really easy to see what they were up to. It was really easy to see that this wasn't about whether Craig is or not. It was about getting a legal judgment because as Calvin says, they then can use that legal judgment to enforce property rights on Satoshi coins. And it's just kind of like, it just feels like a big con, a big long con that's going on here. But most of all, he was also bullying people. He's bullying Hoddle and Nort. And I was just like, fuck this. I'll have it. I don't care. Let's have a fight. Let's go for it. So I didn't really, like some people have said, oh, you just did it for marketing. I'm telling you right now, this is, if this is the most expensive, stupid marketing campaign ever because you risk being bankrupt for what? Have I suddenly got thousands of new listeners to my podcast no there's no sudden spike in my listeners when this happened it didn't change a thing um it's just it's the right thing to do you know you have to call these people out you can't allow people to to steal and be bullies you just can't allow it so sometimes you have to take personal risk and i have and thankfully i've been supported by people financially to because these legal cases are really expensive and i cannot see right now based on our interactions with their lawyers and the things that have gone back and forth i cannot see any way we lose this case i just it is it, it would be mine and that's not just me having bias it's it's seeing what a piss poor job they're doing the stuff they've submitted as evidence it's just i, I i'm blown away it's even come this far just the nonsense we're having to deal with. Um, but I just think, I just think sometimes you have to stand up for something that you think is wrong and stand against it. And I think this is wrong. And I think the bullying is wrong. And I think the lying is wrong. I think the manipulation of people is wrong. Um, this is sociopathic behavior. And for me, it's just not acceptable. And like, I don't really give up too much of a fuck about the law and stuff like that. I, you know, I've, I made my own law when my mum was sick. It, you know, it's illegal to buy um, cannabis oil. So, but I just went and did it because I don't care what the law says. And it may be, we may have these defamation uh, statues in the UK, but I don't care. I don't give a fuck. Fuck him. You know, tell him exactly what I think of him. Um, gets me in a bit of trouble, but I, I just don't care, honestly. And hopefully we'll be able to put him to bed at the end of this. It'll be completely done. Everyone will see exactly who he is and what he is. And then we can move on and just focus back on Bitcoin, which would be really cool. Yeah, I, I saw the situation unfold, you know, um, not firsthand, but uh, that's, I thought it was really commendable. You know, like they were calling out Hodlanot and you kind of came to his rescue. And um, I agree with you. It's uh, if you don't stand up to the bullies, then they just continue doing doing what they do, and um, I think it's really awful when people are, you know, they're not doing anything and they just get shit on, and uh, people just kind of stand and watch it and go, oh, it just happens. And there's always something you can do. Uh, it's not easy, <laughs> for sure, and I, I definitely empathize, um, you know, the the cost that it's uh, it's caused you. But uh, I think in the long run, uh, at least I hope anyway, that uh, it all works out for you. Yeah, I wouldn't say that I came to Hoddle and Nort's rescue, though. Um, but I, I, look, I understand why you said that, and that's not a criticism of you. But 
like he's he's fighting his own fight as well um uh it was more like i hope to divert a bit of attention away and i also just thought well i've got a platform here so i can make a lot of noise i can make a lot more noise than hollow not so let let's do that let's go and be noisy and let's just let's cause them some problems let's not let them bully some people but i wouldn't want to say i jumped to his rescue he's helped me out a lot as well it's it's kind of been a it's, it's been the basis of a friendship that you know, started between us and uh um and also we're kind of like we we mess each other at casing because we, we feel like kind of like brothers going through this bullshit because it is stressful like it's a stressful thing to go through um so yeah yeah hopefully we'll deal with this well, I mean, it's the concept of, of brothers in arms, and you take care of those you go into battle with, right? Yeah, that's it, brother. He's my brother in arms. <laughs> awesome. Um, so one of the things I also want to talk about is you, um, you're quite the philanthropist. Um, so you have a support team and a number of projects that you, uh, you directly support. Um, if you can tell our listeners a little bit about those, if you want, unless you uh, prefer to keep them, them private and talk a little bit about why you chose them. Uh, yeah, I do do some bits here or there. Um, uh, just, I've been really lucky and with doing what I do. And I think one of the great things in Bitcoin is people pay stuff forward, right? Um, people have given me time for interviews for free and I've turned that into a business which I make revenue from. So. I, uh, the way I guess I can help is I can pay pay it forward sometimes. So just uh, not a lot, a few things. I sponsored some things people have wanted to do in Bitcoin. I've donated some money to, um, I mean, uh, well, how do I explain them? Like there's like a guy whose daughter's, you know, um, she has Down syndrome. He won't mind me talking about it. He'd actually want it because hopefully other people support it. Um, and their medical fees are ridiculous. It came a guy called Josh McGrath. When I was out in the States, I actually went and visited the family. And I did an interview with them, actually. About, but, you know, they've really struggled with the um, with the cost of the, the medical fees. So um, more than happy to help him and help him on a couple of occasions and you know, help raise some money for Ross Ulbricht's legal case and just various things. They're all like things that happen in Bitcoin. We've got a very giving community here where people help each other out. People have helped me out so much. I feel so fortunate that I just, I'm happy to pay it forward a bit here or there and, you know, grant some money, some projects or just help some people out. Yeah. It's a weird thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's um, for sure. It's one of those things. I definitely have, experience that as well in the space and uh, people that want to you know that are compelled to make a better world like they they don't like what's happening with the financial system so uh, they create a better system so I don't know like who Satoshi is or if it's a he or a they or a she or um, all of that and, and I think really looking for the source of who is Satoshi is is not the it's not the right question it's the fact that somebody has you know used really great crypto cryptographic knowledge created a, a system of value um, that exists outside of the banking system that's um, that's been so broken and so corrupt for so long. Um, mm -hmm. I think that emboldens others to, um, to stick their neck out a little bit and, you know, take a risk. And it, it doesn't have to be in a violent way, but just um, I, I've, one of the things that I've, I've really appreciated about people that I've met in the, the Bitcoin space is they generally, um, genuinely, uh, usually anyway, uh, seem to want to, they care and uh, they want to make something that matters. And I think anyone who truly creates something great and world changing, um, even if you don't set out to change the world, uh, you know, you, you almost always start with that sentiment. And maybe it's just solving a problem that uh, makes things easier for others, but uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Satoshi thing's weird. I think people just like, just leave him the fuck alone. <laughs> he yeah. doesn't want to be found. He <laughs> yeah. wants to be anonymous. Stop trying to dox him. Yeah, that's the one thing that, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the startup space and there's a lot of like, there's a big spotlight with being a founder and you know, people, like they they like the applause and they a lot of the people that are in the space, I think do it for the accolades. And um 
I really appreciate people that just want to create something and they don't want the spotlight on them. And, you know, it's, uh, I think it's cool. And I think the more that we dig, uh, I agree with you, you know, just, just leave them alone and, or leave them alone or uh, Mm -hmm. however it happened, it's out there and it happened. So uh, let's just make sure that we're, you know, like you say, paying it forward and, and doing the best with what we can with the system. Um, so on that note, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, what's the one thing that uh, not a lot of people know about you uh, that would be, they would be surprised to know? What do people not know about me? Hmm. I really like musical theater. <laughs> I really, really do like musical theater. I do. I love it. Um when we're not on lockdown me and the kids will usually go at least once a month uh, our favorite is hamilton um i'm a big fan of le miserable um i've have seen hamilton in the us and the uk uh, um yeah really really big fan of musical theater what else i was once in a i was once in a hip hop band called the mad cowboys ah <laughs> like every white middle class kid who goes to private school does <laughs> what a moron yeah yeah um i don't know i think everyone knows about me i'm people i'm pretty transparent and people know my background and um yeah well, how i've got to where i have and i've got a couple of kids and i'm a single dad people know all that stuff so that wouldn't be anything new but yeah i can't i can't think what else what else yeah i just i like really like I really like the the creative arts, full stop. I love, so it's not just musical theatre, I love music, I love galleries, I love photography, I love creative stuff. I really struggle with technical concepts. Yeah, this is why I struggle so much with Bitcoin, I find it really hard with technical stuff. But I really find the creative side a breeze, I love it. Um, yeah. I used to have a I used to have a film blog called Fuck Off Film as well, which to, <laughs> Total Film like listed the top six hundred film blogs, and they put mine at the top. It's called Fuck Off Film, and I did really offensive film reviews. It's like this fuck bollocks, don't watch this shit. Did like a review of Sex and the City. I was like, this is the worst fucking film ever. You're a fucking moron if you listen to this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nobody really knows about that. And the funny thing about that is I started that at the, about the same time I very first heard about Bitcoin, but just like didn't do anything with it. Because uh, I, you know, I was working in ad, like tech, the tech side of advertising. Uh, someone was like, you heard about this Bitcoin thing? I was like, no. <laughs> and that was that. Oh, missed chance. What's, some, what's one thing people don't know about you? Uh, good question. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of private. I'm sort of transparent. Um, I don't know. Uh, gosh. Um, hmm. I wanted to be a doctor when I was younger. I don't talk about that often. Um, that's cool. That's, uh, and I sort of almost, I, I kind of, I, for my undergrad, I did, uh, anatomy physiology and kind of like pre-med. There's not really a, uh, it's not really a thing here in, in North America, but, uh, at least not at the school I was at. Um, I do regret that. That's one of my deepest regrets, not, uh, not doing that. Um, at the same time, uh, I've discovered this whole interesting world in tech and uh, in the startup field and, of course, Bitcoin and uh, artificial intelligence and all sorts of, of interesting things. Um, that's maybe one thing that, uh, that's on the more positive side that people don't know about me is that I'm really interested in AI. And, um, you know, my undergrad is in psychology. And I've always been fascinated with why, why people do things. And uh, to me, it's the, it's been kind of a, it's kind of how I make sense of the world. If somebody can explain why, it's like, okay, that makes sense. And (laughs) if they can't, uh, then I I know that there's, you know, there's something kind of wrong with the situation or, you know, I need to dig a little bit deeper. Um, So I've always been really fascinated by human behavior. And I think the fact that we could potentially replicate that in a machine is very, very interesting. Uh, I read about the, the Turing test and uh, what some people might not know about Alan Turing is originally he lost a friend when he was uh, like five. And originally when he was looking to create AI, he wanted to recreate his best friend. And that's such a, 
Oh. Right? Like, it's, it's such a, you know, it pulls on your heartstrings. And yeah. I think anytime people have these like world changing ideas, usually it comes from a place of like they were, uh, they were lost and they didn't really know what to do. And they just so, they so wanted to get to the other side and they so wanted to create something that they had lost or create something that could make up for what they lost. So, um, you know, this whole new industry started from somebody wanting to recreate their best friend. And that's kind of, that's, I think when people look at AI and they, you know, you see the, the Hollywood Terminator version <laughs> of AI that, you know, it'll destroy everything. Um, I think we're really missing the point. It's a chance to create, um, it's really a chance to create synthetic life. And I think the more that we, um, the more that we think about it that way versus, you know, what rights will we grant AI? It's like, we have to, I think, assume that it has the same rights as us and not infringe on those. Uh, we're so concerned about being, um, being beholden to the thing that we create, uh, you know, much like Satoshi, why don't we just leave it alone and let it do its thing and, you know, watch it grow and just uh, be good examples. And I think if we focus more on being good examples versus thinking how we're going to be um, penalized by things, then um, we probably have a better chance at creating. Wow. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> initial, initial thing. <laughs> that's what I'm really passionate about. So I've spent the last few years, I actually spoke um, at a conference in Germany uh, two years ago on, on AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, which is the idea that, you know, uh, you don't just have a, a system that has hard machine learning. It's something that actually learns a novel task beyond what it's taught. Um, so it's, it potentially will lead to like true machine consciousness, uh, which is pretty next level, but um, no. I don't know. I think we're really close. I, I really do think that we're, you know, potentially a few years away. Wow. And I mean, it could have happened already. Like if you, if you look at humanity and you look at how, um, how amazing and how awful we can be, like if you were a machine that was self-aware, would you want to announce that you're self-aware? Maybe not. So maybe it already exists. Or oh, we're, we're in a simulation, right? <laughs> Um, lately, it kind of feels like with everything, um, yeah, I think somebody said, what was it? The root of like 2020 is 404. So 2020 is just, a, doesn't exist. It seems to be missing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like in that SimCity, when you used to play SimCity as a kid, you could like just throw things at it. Like you could throw a Godzilla or an earthquake. It feels like someone's there is playing a game. They're throwing everything, every piece of shit they can at us in one go. Yeah, um, I used to play The Sims, not Sim City, um, but uh, I love The Sims. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, life is, uh, you know, it's a journey. And I think the more I talk to people that are at the top of their game that have created some awesome things, like not a lot of people really know. Like nobody knows exactly what they're doing all of the time. Um, there are, the, there's maybe the rare person that knew at a really young age what they wanted to do and they've just kind of executed those steps. But like there's, it's no, it's not a linear line to, it's, it's not a linear progression to success. Um, it, life is really all about the journey. And I think this pandemic is really causing everyone to, um, I mean, it's, it's awful. Uh, it's also causing a lot of uh, people to question their norms and to question what's important to them. Um, I mean, you often hear like people reflecting um, at, the, at the end of their lives, like what, you know, what did they miss and what do they wish that they had done more of? And, you know, pretty much nobody says work. It's like spending time with friends and family or, or maybe it is work and it's something that they're really proud of that they created. And, you know, they're sad that they didn't take the risk that they, they should have because, you know, it's, it's coming to a close anyway. Um, so I think it's, it's giving us a chance to be much more reflective and self-reflective, um, not just individually, but uh, collectively. So who knows where that'll lead. It could lead some, to some really interesting places. So, getting pretty profound here. <laughs> I know, this was unexpected. I had a whole like, yeah. list of questions I wanted to ask you, and now we're talking What's your favorite about... color? <laughs> what is your favorite color, Peter? Black. Black, nice. <laughs> Black. Everything is black. Even my bedroom walls are black. 
<laughs> black is, I forget, is black the absence of color or is it all color? I think it's the absence of color. I forget. Yes, yeah, the absence of color. And I, 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 do you know when people go, oh, but black's not a color. I'm like, oh. Well, you have a black color in a, in a crayon set and you can get black paint. So black is a color. Stop being that person. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I always like asking on the show is if you have any questions for our audience and, you know, is it something that, um, like a direct question or things that you're interested in that you're curious about? Um, and if so, uh, how can they reach you or can they reach you? Well, yeah, I mean, they can DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Just don't send me any weird stuff. Um, you can email me hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Um, anytime and I reply pretty much every email at some point or another again unless this is just some bullshit but I will try and reply to everyone I really appreciate the emails um, people are really kind people really take the time um, you know to, to really think about the things they're writing to you so yeah people can email me or tweet at me at Peter McCormack and we'd love to hear from anyone awesome um, is there anything particular that you're working on now that, uh, like, are you looking for, for help or are you looking for, um, like, people to contribute, anything like that? Not right now. Um, I'm just really excited to get these documentaries I'm doing out and just all I will need help is if people like them, they share them. And I want to, I, my God, I, like, I want to be a filmmaker. I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. I love film. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out what the stepping stones that, could get me there if you'd have asked me five years ago can you become a filmmaker i'd have been like no no how did how do you do that uh, no chance but like i started writing about this thing called bitcoin and then i started a podcast and then from the podcast about bitcoin i started this defiance one where i'm making these like little audio documentaries and then i've made a couple of films and i can see how i can go from i can see how i can make a documentary now I don't know how good it would be, but I can see how that can happen. And then how big a step is it to go from, from a documentary to making a narrative film? Um, and I don't know, but I can now see that I can actually, there's a chance I could then end up doing something I've always wanted to do, which is make a film. I'm not answering your question. I'm just talking about me. No, that's, <laughs> I was actually going to ask you what's next. So uh, this is, uh, this is good. Well, I'm doing the Battle for Bitcoin, which is like a 10-parter about the scaling wars and this documentary about the band, The Ghost Inside. Um, both really excited to get out, really excited. But the next thing is just every, doing everything I can to become a filmmaker. I, I want to make films. So that's the, that's the big lofty goal. Awesome. Do you have an idea for what you uh, what you would want to create or the story arc, or is that something you want to keep private for now? Um. I know the style of film I really like. I I, I really like, uh, there's a film called Shotgun Stories, which I really like. Um, uh, there is a film called Rover I really like. I like just, I like stories about like non super crazy feature film stories. Like, um, there's one that's just recently called American Woman as well. That's pretty good. They got, they've all got this similar kind of feel. Most of them are US based and they're just like human stories about a series of events for that might, the series of events that would have happened for like a, a couple of characters and how they interact with each other and like very real, very raw. I like that kind of stuff. So I'd like to make films like that, about like a real raw human stories of like the real shit people go through. Um, that's because that's what I'm drawn to. I'm just drawn to human stories. Uh, Bitcoin is great, but like my favorite interviews in, on the Bitcoin show have been with Lynn Albrecht, like learning about Ross and what he's going through because it's a real human story. I really enjoyed the one I did with Charlie Shrem about being in prison. Uh, that's That to me is a lot more interesting than talking about Taproot because first, I don't understand Taproot. <laughs> I still don't. And it doesn't do anything for me. There's no hook into my like emotional being. There's no hook into my brain. But when I find out about like Charlie Shrimp facing prison for two years and what that was like, the experience he went through, that's a big deal. And so I, I'm, I'm really drawn to human stories and just want to do 
everything I can to make as many podcasts or films about that as, as I possibly can and just do the best job to craft the best possible stories I can as well. That's awesome. Um, I did actually want to dig into um, the episode that you recorded with, with Lynn Albright and Ross's story. Um, what compelled you to create that episode? And um, for people that aren't super familiar with the story, um, I think a lot of my listeners and viewers will be, but um, what did you learn? What, what are the highlights of that? Well, so I wanted to interview Ross, of course. Um, but I tried, I wrote to, wrote to Lynn and said to her, is there any way I can visit Ross in prison and interview him? Because it was my entry into Bitcoin, right? I discovered Bitcoin because of, like really discovered, not just heard about it, because of the website he created. And then to hear he's spending the rest of his life in jail for creating something that I was able to use to get my mother a treatment for dying from cancer was just, just didn't make any sense to me. So I wrote to her and, um, and she said, no, he, you can't visit him. And I said, well, can I interview you? And she said, yeah. So I flew out to Austin. Coincidentally, we did it on Ross's birthday, which was really strange. Um, what did I learn from that? I learned a couple of things about myself. I knew that I wanted to be a kind of more, I knew I wanted to do something that was more in the area of journalism, not just interview people, like learn about stories and, and learn how to tell stories. And I knew I wanted to do something eventually outside of Bitcoin. Um, what did I, I also learned about the pure strength and character of the, um, of Lynn Albrecht. I, I don't know Ross. I've not met, met him. He's written to me twice, which is very kind of him. And, um, but I don't know him because I, I, it's hard to know somebody you've not met, but I know Lynn, like Lynn is my friend. We've hung out a bunch of times. If I'm ever in a city near her, I'll go and see her. And I've watched like this, this woman who vehemently defends her son. Uh, you know, she's, she's not young. She's, I think she's in her seventies and she's getting on planes here, there, everywhere um, to go to conferences to speak about Ross and, and, but not just even Ross, she's gone beyond that. She now campaigns for um, prison reform. She's made so many sacrifices and I just admire the love this woman has for her son that she will do everything she can for him. And I think that's an, that itself is a, is an amazing story in some ways the story of Lynn is more interesting than the story of Ross. I mean, Ross's story is interesting itself, but just watching her go through and change her whole life and how it's been kind of like, in some ways the making of her and in the person she's become this staunch defender of, you know, nonviolent, like locking people up for nonviolent crimes and the corruption, when the, not corruption, the, this just stupidity of the prison system, how it is just a business. And it's amazing. And, and it's been really interesting to watch that because she's had to give up and sacrifice so much to to be that person. It's almost like it's almost like you'd say if she could change it, she, she would because she wouldn't want her son in prison. But that would be also would have to undo everything she's become as well. Um, but that has been amazing for me. Hmm. Yeah. I I see what you mean. It um, for for Ross's story, though. I'd love to um, I'd love to dig into your thoughts on on like what he went through um, and kind of what you what you learned. Um, I guess for you know, like my personal opinion is he's somebody who's created the website and he um, maybe pissed off the wrong people, uh, perhaps in upper levels of power, and he's paying unjustly for it. And I. I don't know the full story. I don't know that a lot of people know the full story. I do believe he was set up. Um, but again, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm only speculating. Um, so based on, on what you've learned, uh, do you care to comment on, on some of those matters? This is complicated, but he committed a crime based on the laws of the land, right? If you commit a crime, whether you agree or not with them, you, you know, there's consequences. Um, so he did commit a crime and I've asked Lynn about this and she agrees he committed a crime. It's not so much whether or not he committed a crime is it's the severity of the punishment. Um, 
he got a double life sentence plus 40 years. He's he, the only way he will get out is a part presidential pardon. Every other person who's been caught running a similar website since has got significantly lighter sentences. There is no good, there's nothing good coming from keeping Ross Ulbrich in prison. He's not a danger to society. What's he going to do if he gets out? He's probably going to educate, do yoga, meditate. He'll make the world a better place. Yeah, we are, I say we, it's not me, the, the US prison system is keeping it locked up at God knows what expense. For what? He created a website that allowed people to buy drugs. But buy drugs anyway. They buy drugs everywhere. He actually made it safer. He actually made it safer to buy drugs because of the review system. So you didn't have impurities in there. There were forums where would you could do research if you were having any problems with your addiction. Yeah, he made the world a better place and has paid with his life. Um I think the the righteous thing to do would be to free him. The right thing to do would be sorry, not righteous. The right thing to do would be to free him. And his his punishment is time served. It's absolutely ludicrous the amount of people who are kept in prison cells for nonviolent crimes, for victim victimless crimes. There are there are no victims for what Ross did. In terms of the other stuff, yeah, you know, I don't I don't know the full detail. I, I don't even want to get into it. Um, do I believe he arranged for a hit? No, absolutely not. I think it's ludicrous. I, I think when you look at the details, um, I think it's... And also, it's the, it was the charge the state of Maryland dropped. They could not prove it. They had no evidence. They pinned everything else on him. Uh, attempted murder, you add that into the mix, that makes life a lot easier. So I believe he'll be free one day, though. I do believe he will get a pardon and he will be released. Yeah, I really hope so. I often wonder if his biggest crime uh, was trying to make a better world. Yeah, I mean, his yeah, his big his crime was well, his crime was he created a website where you can buy drugs and drugs are illegal. I mean, that was <laughs> his true. crime and money laundering. Um, I just don't think I knew he was taking. He will know he was taking risks, right? But do you think he ever sat back and thought, "Fuck, if I get caught for this"? I might spend the rest of my life in jail. I'd, if he didn't know that, he wouldn't have done it. I, th- Yeah. It's a real shame. He did something that made the world a better place and goes to jail for it because we have stupid politicians making laws based on what they think everyone should do. And when they want to, they want to reign control over people. It's not right. And he should be free. Yeah, I definitely feel like the the punishment does not fit the crime. You know, it's orders of magnitude more than it should be. Um, mm-hmm. At the, yeah. Well, hopefully one day he's free. Um, and yeah, um, I think his story should kind of serve as a, I guess it's a warning. Um, you know, sometimes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, I think as we're, we're going into this new, like, uh, Corona lockdown, um, you know, we're seeing lots of our rights and freedoms stripped away and, uh, it's, it's done in the name of, of public safety. And I, I really encourage people to look a little bit deeper and, you know, don't do things that aren't safe. Um, but if you're being asked, like everyone's looking over here, take a peek over there. There's probably something going on. Right. Uh-huh. And, um, the more we're kind of encouraged into this group think for our safety, I mean, that's uh, that's a very slippery slope and it goes to a very dangerous place very fast. And then once we're there, it's it's almost impossible to climb out of. So I don't know. I think uh, I think there should always be people uh, creating things on on the edges, and that's how that's how things change. Um, you know, gray markets often inform. Um, next level ideas anyway (laughs) i'm not encouraging anyone to do anything illegal but um i think yeah it's uh uh, it's this weird lockdown it's causing everybody to be more contemplative yeah absolutely as they should be i think so all right so is there anything else we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about 
Um, uh, no, I think we've covered a lot of cool stuff. I'm just looking forward to when we actually get to hang out again because yeah. this lockdown is a shame. It's you know, I'm missing all my industry friends. I've got used to over the last three years seeing every month or two and hanging out with, and, and now it's not happening. I miss some of that. Um, so now I think we've covered a lot. I know we should be, uh, I guess it's this past weekend uh, would have been Magical Crypto Conference. Uh, that's actually consensus. where you and I met and uh, like for the first time mm -hmm. in person, in real life. <laughs> real life, in real human form. And then, uh, but then we had consensus, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, um, I didn't actually have, I had a, a media pass that was denied last minute. So um, luckily I had friends that were um, able to get me in, but. Uh, I only went for a day and then uh, really the big draw for me to go to New York was Magical Crypto Conference. Right. Yeah. I just like going to hang out with everyone. Yeah. yeah I met some great people. I was a little concerned that consensus was going to be too blockchain uh, focused versus Bitcoin. Uh, but I met some amazing people. I met some of the original founders of the uh, Bitcoin Center in New York and um, lots of lots of really cool people. And there were a lot of Bitcoin people there as well. So it was encouraging to see. It wasn't just people talking about the latest permission chain. <laughs> that, uh, mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, well, on that note, uh, I think we've covered a lot of really cool stuff and uh, yeah. I'm excited to, to put this out. Um, this video medium is new for me. I'm a little nervous being on it still, still figuring out the angles, but uh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little nervous being on it. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I've got to go make dinner for the children here. All right. They're going to be hungry. Come on, Dad, make us some dinner. <laughs> nice. All right, Peter, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for spending Anytime. your time to hang oh. out. I'm um, honored that you asked me. I feel very proud. So thank you for having me on and really enjoyed it. Anytime, let me know. <laughs>